So welcome to this second public lecture offered by the Stardust program. Uh, let me spend just a couple of words about the Stardust program. Uh, Stardust is a research and training uh, program uh, supported by the uh, Marie Curie action of the European Commission. You see here. Um, so we are a network of universities and uh, um, companies and, and agencies. There are 14 partners. And what we're going to do is to um, do research on asteroids and, and space debris. And as part of the research uh, and training on, on asteroids and space debris, we are going to have also a number of outreach activities. And, and these public lectures are really uh, to, to offer you uh, the best on, on science and science fiction, um, asteroids, and whatever is in space. Um, so tonight, uh, we have a science fiction writer. And uh, we have Professor Colin McGuinness, who is going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, while I'm handing over the mics, um, I just want to remind you that we are broadcasting live. So don't make any nasty noise or bad comments or and don't walk in front of the camera. Okay. Unless you want to become famous. <laughs> OK, um, thanks, Max. I'm Colin McInnes. Uh, I'm director of the Advanced Space Concepts Lab uh, here at Strathclyde University. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, uh, a very warm welcome to University of Strathclyde. And for those colleagues who have been here uh, all week for the, the Stardust uh, workshop, then uh, a warm welcome back. Um, I'm absolutely delighted. Oops. Absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Liz Williams as our guest uh, speaker this evening. Uh, and like most uh, rocket scientists, I'm a huge uh, science fiction fan, so it's, it's absolutely great to, to, to have Liz here this evening. Um, and in fact, so, so much a fan, uh, I'm out of SF. I attended, in fact, I spoke at uh, EasterCon, which was uh, uh, here in Glasgow at Easter weekend and attracted over 800 uh, science fiction fans from all over the world. And it was a fantastic event, so it's great to, to have uh, Liz here so soon afterwards. Um, Dr. Williams is a very accomplished uh, novelist uh, and a short story writer. She has a PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. And she has a, an eclectic career, um, which spans uh, variously being a, a tarot card reader in Brighton Pier. Uh, working for an educational program in Kazakhstan, and then becoming a full-time uh, science fiction writer in 2002. And her novels include uh, Winter Strike, which is set on a terraformed Mars, which is a, a technical subject very close to, close to my heart. Uh, so it really just leaves me to please welcome uh, our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Liz Williams. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Hiatus while we attach these to me. I'm going to take this slowly and carefully. Men have pockets, you see. <laughs> so do women sometimes, but I didn't bring any pockets. <laughs> so this will take a moment. So I am beset with microphones. There we go. OK, do you want to check that I am all wired up? All right. OK, um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. The subject of this talk is, very loosely, science fiction and the galactic frontier. And we're going to be looking at all manner of frontiers, because these are the sorts of things that science fiction 
tries to address. These are the things that science fiction thinks it can deal with well. And those frontiers are external. They involve travel into space, the concept of strange new worlds, strange civilizations. But they're also internal, into the intricacies of the human mind and of human culture. And in order to have a look at this, we're going to look at the history of science fiction and what this kind of writing or this kind of media is trying to do and why we respond to it. It's often described as escapist and I think this is a misinterpretation of what it actually is and what it tries to do. It shows us what we long for, what we're striving for, what we reach for, and it shows us what we fear. And it interprets that other country, the future, for us in ways that are perhaps successful, perhaps unsuccessful, but they are all experimental, they are all trying to explain. So how old is science fiction? We think of it as a really contemporary genre. If you had to describe a contemporary literary or film genre, science fiction would be it because it describes the future. But I think it's much older than that. People have always told fantastic stories. They try to make sense of the world around them. Their look at narratives, their telling of stories, are trying to explain big phenomena, storms, earthquakes, volcanoes, the phenomena of the natural world which besets them. It's a kind of magical thinking in which telling stories about things, seeking to explain them, gives you power. If you can give an account several thousand years ago of why the next village has been dis destroyed by a tidal wave, the sea god is angry perhaps, then you can avoid a similar fate in future by placating the sea god more thoroughly with offerings than your unfortunate neighbours. Now we see this as magical thinking rather than scientific thinking. In a sense, it's the conceptualization of desperation. People are beset by things that they don't understand and they try to explain them by telling stories about them. If you think this is confined to thousands of years ago, there was an unfortunate case in China this week in which a woman's son went missing on the riverbank. She dressed in a bridal gown and threw herself into the river as the bride of the river god to give her son back again. Now, to us in this world, that seems like a very extreme things, thing to do. To our ancestors, that would have been an experimental approach. Maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't. But it's trying to tell a story that explains the world. And these are all big stories. They deal with really big issues. Big cosmological issues, the start of the world, how the world begins, creation stories. Um, they're not seeking to explain a better way to grow turnips. You know, they might deal with agricultural cycles. But the thing is that these early narratives, which we don't tend to see as fantasy or science fiction, but they're where fantasy and science fiction start, are ways of interpreting the natural world. Stories have a sacred role in early times, but they're also entertaining. They're multi-textual. They contain layers of spirituality, psychology, early scientific thinking, and sheer enjoyment. The Greek sagas, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are based on the doings of gods and men. And it's thought that the wandering bard retelling the Odyssey over and over again would tailor those stories to the place where you were sitting. So Odysseus might have visited the place that you yourself are sitting in, listening. You're the center of the story. And so for a while, you're the center of the world. And these epics travel. They're very popular. And they continue to be really popular today. The Odyssey gets translated into an early Irish fantasy, maybe I, I think 8th or 9th century, called Muldoon. And it's basically somebody in Ireland thought, well, the Greeks have this story, but why don't we have a story about a bloke who goes to all these different islands? He meets different cultures. He meets fantastic phenomena. He has great adventures. Why can't we have one of those? And so 
Muldoon was written. And it's, it reads like an early fantasy epic. Muldoon sets sail in search of his missing father, and he travels among a skein of marvelous islands. They come to an island which is uninhabited, but there's a great hall with a feast. And there are fires burning and food on the table. And there's nothing there except a little white cat sitting on a pillar. And at the end of the story, one of Muldoon's crew members insults the cat. And it leaps through him like a fiery arrow and kills him. And they leave fast in case it does it again. It's an episodic saga. But if you think of Star Trek Voyager, hundreds of years later, what do you have? You have a ship that gets lost, that travels to different places, that meets different civilizations, that meets phenomena that it can't explain. So Muldoon, with its magical islands, is a very familiar narrative structure to us now. It's got that element of the strange, of the wonderful, of the new horizon, the new frontier, a frontier that doesn't exist, but we make it up. We tell stories about it. We set adventures into it. And it's one of the first real fantasy stories of the British Isles and of Ireland. Another example is the saga of Beowulf. He's a hero of the Geats in Scandinavia. He comes to the aid of Hrothgar, the king of the Danes whose mead hall is under attack by a monster. Beowulf slays him. The monster's mother shows up. Beowulf attacks her too. And it's got all the elements that continue to inspire science fiction writers, fantasy writers in particular, today. It's got a hero, a monster, dragons, and unexplained events. And it accompanies a growing body of folklore in the British Isles as wave upon wave of people come across the water from the continent and settle and they bring their stories with them. So their stories accrete in layers like an onion. They incorporate elements of earlier stories. They change later stories that come after them to produce the matter of Britain. Tales and legend which contemporary fantasy draws so much on. Game of Thrones draws on all of this kind of thing. Lord of the Rings particularly, but also science fiction. And as the centuries go by, people start widening the boundaries of the world. New exploration, and this I stress is from the point of view of the West, um, but of course everybody else is doing it as well. It expands the worldview of the population in Europe. European voyages to America, north and south. They increase European un people's understanding of, of new worlds, new frontiers. Your little insular village is no longer quite the center of the world. It might be to you, but you become aware that there is a much bigger world out there, full of wonders, full of marvels. And people start expanding that concept of the geographical frontier into other worlds, the fantasy worlds of fairyland. You can be sucked into fairyland, you'll lose time, strange things will happen to you, you'll be spat out again maybe hundreds of years later. People start writing about these worlds. Gulliver's Travels, written by Defoe as satire, are like Muldoon. They see our hero encountering strange islands full of wonderful life forms a little bit like the Odyssey. He meets very small people. He meets giants. He meets a race of philosophical talking horses, which is always fun. And they teach him about other ways of being. They teach him about their civilizations. And this interest in other possible cultures <coughs> from the fixed way in which our culture is always seen hierarchical, with a particular social setting. This changes, and it sparks the idea of the utopia. The utopia is also a frontier. It is the perfect world, and it preoccupies a strand of literature um, from the Elizabethan period onwards. People keep returning to the idea of utopia, the perfected world. Later on, they get into dystopias, but we'll talk about that later. And it's after the Industrial Revolution that writers start marrying those ideas 
into more scientific paradigms. So one of the first and still most one of the most famous um, novels, I forgot Beowulf, that's a bit of Beowulf for you, Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley before she was actually out of her teens. She was a teenager when she wrote Frankenstein. It's not the first story of the creation of artificial life, because that actually appears in folklore, the myth of the golem, for example, um, and it appears in legend, but its title character, hundreds of years later, is still a household word. Everybody knows what Frankenstein is. She started it when she was 19, and she finished it a year later. And the idea for the book, famously, occurred to her when she was on holiday with Percy Bysshe Shelley and Byron, her husband and his friend, by a waking dream in which I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half vital motion. This is typical teenage writing, I have to say. It's very purple prose. Um, but when she related it, Byron apparently ran screaming from the room, which, you know, that's poets for you, but anyway. Um, there's some doubt as to whether the dream is actually the, the true story of Frankenstein's origin. I think Mary might have been exaggerating, apparently. Um, but in itself, it enhances the myth. Um, there's also a, a theory that the model for the charismatic, half-crazed genius of Victor Frankenstein was actually Shelley himself. In the novel, Frankenstein creates his monster when he is himself still a student probably forbidden by Strathclyde University regulations, um, but probably familiar to Shelley because he was prone to conducting scientific experiments in his rooms. It's unlikely that he created artificial life, but you know, you never know. And it's this creation of life through artificial means that's earned Mary's novel, The Cache, as the first science fiction novel. Whether it actually deserves that um, we don't know, but the monster is created by means of a quasi-scientific apparatus. Um, but his creation results actually from Frankenstein's understanding of alchemical processes. So you're still seeing this kind of medieval bleed of the alchemical into the scientific um, from Cornelius Agrippa. Um, but the body count is exceedingly high. It's a horror novel. It's, it's lurid. And it's part of the model that has informed elements of science fiction ever since. Um, reviewers thought it was a tissue of horrible and disgusting absurdity. Didn't go down well. Um, but we owe Mary Shelley a great debt for kick-starting several genres at once before the age of 20. Frankenstein can be considered as an internal frontier. We've looked at the voyages, the islands. Now we're looking at the inner world, a warning about where experimentation can lead us, where it goes wrong. We're looking at the limitations of the human body, the human mind, and it highlights what becomes over the centuries a growing concern about scientific hubris, over-ambitiousness and the perils of science gone wrong. These are the things that really drive a lot of science fiction and horror. And it's, a, it's a gothic novel, and gothic novels are based on overwrought emotions. It goes inward, and then over the next hundred years, next couple of hundred years, science fiction starts to look outward again. We start having the work of writers like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. This is very much a brief overview, by the way. We've only got an hour. So Mary Shelley hung out with poets. Verne preferred opera started off as a librettist, and for some years his attentions were divided between the theatre and work, but his traveller's stories, um, he wrote a series of traveller's stories, um, and this showed him where he was really going. Imaginative, extravagant voyages and adventures, in which a host of scientific and geographical details, even though he made a lot of them up, obviously, they lend an air of verisimilitude, if not realism. Verne's father discovered that his son was actually writing rather than studying law and cut off financial support. Understandably, happens all the time. And Verne was supposed to uh, basically go into, the, into stockbroking, which he did for a while. But then he got married 
and his wife encouraged him to start writing again and actually find a publisher. And he did. He met a guy called Pierre Jules Hetzel, who is one of the most important French publishers of the 19th century, also published Victor Hugo. And they formed a kind of editorial partnership until Verne's, until Hetzel's death. Hetzel took Verne's writings and tinkered with them, including the ones that have been rejected again and again. So if you're an aspiring writer, take note. Um, he read one of Verne's stories about the balloon exploration of uh, Africa. It was rejected by publishers on the grounds that it was too scientific. It probably wasn't, actually, but there you go. That's what they felt. And he rewrote the story, which became Five Weeks in a Balloon. He added comedy to his writing. He changed sad endings into happy endings, always popular with readers. He toned down the politics. And they sold by the bucket load. Hetzel was publishing two or more volumes a year. Vo Voyage to the Center of the Earth, Journey to the Center of the Earth, From the Earth to the Moon, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and Around the World in 80 Days. And Verne was then able to make a living from his writing. I'm using Verne as an illustration because he is the frontiersman extraordinaire. He goes everywhere in imagination. He goes underneath the sea. He goes to the center of the earth. He goes into space. And he goes around the world. His vision in terms of where his characters were placed geographically is very, very broad. And I think a lot of this accounts for his popularity. If you can't travel very extensively, you want to read about people very often who do. And if those places are the places of the imagination, to an extent, the more popular you will find them. Because they're introducing you to concepts and ideas and situations and locations that you will never see for yourself. And I think a lot of this is actually the impetus behind some of the popularity of contemporary science fiction. It takes you to places that you could not physically go to. It takes you inside to places that you could not go to. We don't have, at the moment, artificial human life. Frankenstein takes us to that place. Most of us are never going to journey to the bottom of the ocean. Verne takes us there. And the other frontier that people start looking at is the future. Now, futuristic fiction is actually relatively new in the sense that these early stories are looking at the past, how the world was made, how the world was created. They're looking at places around our world that are parallel that we might go to, the moon, but in current time. In terms of Verne, they're set in his day. But people are starting to look towards the future and starting to make predictions and prophecies about what it would be like. And this is where we come to the next great progenitor of modern science fiction, H.G. Wells. His first bestseller in 1901 was Anticipations. And when it was originally serialized, it was subtitled An Experiment in Prophecy. It's anticipating what the world would be like in the year 2000. Now, he got some things right. He said that trains and cars would result in the dispersal of populations from cities, and people would start um, working more from home. There are moral restrictions which decline because people are going to be looking at, at um, greater sexual and personal freedom. He predicted the defeat of German militarism, and he also predicted the existence of a European Union. He's looking again at utopias, but he's looking at potential utopias and dystopias in a futuristic setting. He got things wrong. He didn't expect to see successful aircraft before 1950. And he said that his imagination refuses to see any sort of submarine doing anything but suffocating its crew and founders at sea. So, okay, not, not so good with the prediction there. He's inventing a number of themes 
that are classic in science fiction, in worlds like The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, The War of the Worlds, The First Men in the Moon. And he's writing other non-fantastic novels which received critical acclaim. He's examining our need for the frontier and our fears through the genre of science fiction. His satire in Edwardian advertising, Tono Bungay, wasn't actually a science fiction novel, but it does feature radioactive decay. Scientists of the day were aware that the natural decay of radium releases energy at a slow rate, but the rate of release is too slow to have practical utility. I'm sure there's going to be contention in the audience with this. My scientific knowledge of this is not great. Um, but his novel revolves around an unspecified invention that accelerates the process of radioactive decay. So it produces bombs that explode with no more than the force of an ordinary high explosive, um, but which continue to explode for days on end. And where he is looking at is coming wars. So again, he's anticipating future events. And this time, it's the nightmare not the dream. Quite early in his career, uh, Wells had a great interest in sociology and politics and wrote a number of utopian novels. He starts with the world rushing towards catastrophe until people realize that there's a better way of living. Whether this is by mysterious gases from a comet causing people to suddenly behave rationally, which is a really far out idea in the days of the comet, or a world council of scientists taking over the shape of things to come, which he later adapted for the Alexander Corder film. And this depicted the impending world war, Syri cities destroyed by aerial bombs. And he portrayed social reconstruction through the rise of fascist dictatorships. He's looking at all kinds of frontiers here, the scientific and the social and the personal. He's questioning humanity in books like The Island of Dr. Moreau. This is dystopian. The narrator is trapped on an island full of animals that have vivisected into human beings. And when he returns to England, when he escapes, he sees his fellow man as barely civilized, slowly reverting towards its animal nature. Well seems to veer between optimism and pessimism, and this is kind of a tension in science fiction that we're still undergoing today. Dystopias are easier to write. Um, there is a tendency for utopias to be a bit boring. So you've got to kind of go outwards and, um, and look for adventures elsewhere. But towards the 20s and beyond, um, we're starting to see science fiction opening up. More people are writing about it. More people are using its ideas. Its ideas are becoming common currency, and to an extent they're coming from science and they're affecting science. Carol Capek's RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, in which society is partly automated. The very early look at automation and how it affects society, how it impacts on human beings. This is later taken up by people like Isaac Asimov, um, the Terminator. It's still an enduring theme. People are still fascinated back to Frankenstein, by the idea of creating artificial life. Science fiction is gaining wider public attention throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s. We're looking at the golden age, so-called, which historian Adam Roberts characterizes as hard SF, linear narratives, heroes solving problems or countering threats in a space opera or a technological adventure idiom. And um, Peter Graham also says that the golden age of science fiction is 12, <laughs> which is basically the, the age at which people tend to discover it and get excited by it, which uh, is not as dismissive as it sounds. You have people like John W. Campbell, legendary in the genre as an editor and publisher of many science fiction magazines. It's the pulps that really kind of get science fiction going in terms of the literary. Under Campbell's editorship, magazines like Astounding Science Fiction develop more realism and psychological depth. We're starting to move inward again. Science fiction's gone out, coming back into the personal. <laughs> 
And a lot of the most enduring science fiction cliches, as we now see, are established in Golden Age literature. Isaac Asimov goes back to robots. He establishes the canonical three laws of robotics, beginning with the 1941 short story, Liar. There's a celebration, however, of scientific achievement and a genuine sense of wonder that science can solve problems. It's very optimistic at this stage. Robert Heinlein's 1950 novels, 1950s novels such as The Puppet Masters and Starship Troopers, start looking at, to an extent, the politics, libertarian ideologies, people breaking out from social control, people doing their own thing, people exploring, expanding, going off and having adventures. And the Golden Age is looking also at the reemergence of religious and spiritual themes. Um, Hugo Gernsback, another famous editor, tried to eliminate these and make it more scientific. But people are actually starting to look back to the spiritual, combining it with the scientific. Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. Um, James Blish, A Case of Conscience. Uh, Walter Miller's A Canticle for Leibovitch. All of these are looking at the internal again. They're looking at how people respond to religion, how religion can affect societies in either a positive or more usually a negative way. Sometimes religion and science clash and of course this is a theme that we keep coming back to in, in our own societies, particularly at the moment the states, creationism versus evolution. But it's a theme that science fiction has already exhaustively explored. The beginning of the Golden Age coincided with the first world con. We're getting another one in the summer. Um, this was in 1939, the first one. So world, world science fiction conventions have been going for quite a while. And for the fans who are involved and the readers, science fiction is becoming quite a powerful social force. It's not always a social force of which parents necessarily approve. Their children are reading things like amazing stories, and looking at pictures like this. The Bug-Eyed Monster, stereotypical science fiction cover. Um, I'm putting this up here because it's still how a lot of people see science fiction. It's just that. It's just adventure. But as we're seeing, it's a lot more. And in the 50s, you start to see connections between science fiction and the historical process. Science fiction always reflects hopes, those utopias, but it also reflects fears. The Second World War brings fears of dictatorships and dystopias, as opposed to the utopian visions of people who came before. People are starting to not only question the inevitability of the scientific process, scientific progress itself, um, but they're starting to be actively afraid of science after events like Hiroshima. Science fiction addresses a lot of those fears. It's always addressed it to an extent, but it's really starting to look at it. Uh, we see the rise of the Soviet Union, and in American media science fiction particularly, fears of people being taken over by alien life that looks like us. That people are being infiltrated by ideas and notions that are foreign to the founding fabric of the nation. You have films like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, illustrating the, Mar the McCarthy era's fear of being taken over. You know, you think your kids are nice, normal, all-American baseball playing lads, and suddenly they start coming out with all this communist stuff. It's as though aliens have taken them over. And I'm sure there's still a fear of that today. It gets reflected in things like When Worlds Collide, The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Thing, It Came From Outer Space, The Quatermass Experiment, and, of course, invasion of the body snatchers itself, the pod people. Our children are becoming pod people. They are being taken over by alien thought processes. And this gets objectified into actual alien life. One of the reasons we're fascinated by aliens, I think, or some of us anyway, um, are that they allow us to explore the human condition. So when you're looking at aliens with weird foreheads on Star Trek, what you're actually looking at are other human cultures. They are metaphors. 
for the human condition. Science fiction was always very popular in the Soviet Union and a lot of it was allowed to be published because of things like that. It's just seen as fun adventure. An awful lot of political commentary passed under the radar because writers could say, I'm writing about Mars or I'm writing about Martians. I'm not writing about our beloved, wonderful, you know, 50,000 year old culture that it will be. I'm not writing about the Soviet Union. I'm not criticizing that. I'm criticizing Martians. How could you possibly take exception to that? It's a metaphorical structure for looking at human life and human society. It always has been, but it starts to change. And by the mid-1960s, um, science fiction writers are starting to chafe a bit at the limits of what they can actually do. Too many people working with the same few traditional themes and feeling that what the genre is producing is becoming over-predictable. You're getting the Young Turks coming in, writers like Thomas Dish, Harlan Ellison, many of whom are still around today and criticizing the Young Turks who are coming up behind them. And they felt that although science fiction is supposed to emphasize change and newness, new frontiers, it's becoming more of a straitjacket. It's becoming too conservative. And there's no reason to suppose, um, they said, that publishers would not be grateful for science fiction becoming more radical, more unconventional, more challenging. And they really tried to change the envelope. The Science Fiction Foundation feels that many of the so-called science fiction experiments of the period were not experiments at all, but merely an adoption of narrative strategies and sometimes ironies that had long been familiar in mainstream novels. But the point is that science fiction writers were trying to experiment. J.G. Ballard, Michael Moorcock, trying to add something new to the protocols of prose fiction. We're getting what's called the new wave in terms of SF. And it's breaking down barriers between literary fiction and science fiction. It's not a formal literary movement, and it's hard to define. And the Science Fiction Foundation suggests that its fundamental element, which I think is still extant today, is the belief that science fiction could and should be taken seriously as literature. Because it's dealing with the human condition, it's dealing with where we're going, it's dealing with where we could be, and it's dealing with where we've been. It's all those frontier aspects again. This frontier is internal, to an extent, or social, because a lot of the new wave shares the qualities of late 1960s counterculture. There's an interest in mind-altering drugs. There's an interest in oriental religions, violation of taboos, a marked interest in sex. Science fiction kind of sexes up. And there's a strong involvement in pop art and in the media. Science fiction is, has always been media oriented since we started having movies and TV. But in the 60s, with shows like Star Trek, it's coming out more to a popular audience. People are watching it, whereas they wouldn't necessarily read it. It's still the case. You get a lot of people who are watching fantasy series, watching science fiction, um, they don't necessarily pick up a science fiction book. They see them as two different things. And yet, those programs, Battlestar Galactica, Game of Thrones, are some of the most popular science fiction, some of the most popular television that we have today. There is a reason for that, and I think this reason is, again, this looking outward, looking inward, this tension between the internal frontier and the external frontier, exploring a sense of wonder, looking at things we could not possibly experience, and in many cases wouldn't want to experience, but genre gives us the ability to do so. The new wave is more dystopian. It looks at um, problems that are starting to occur to people in terms of where we are going as a planet environmental disasters, overpopulation, make room, make room is an example of that. Um, Logan's Run, 
Nobody lives beyond 30. There are too many people. They get killed. All of these things, political dictatorships, are problems that we have that science fiction thinks it can address. Usually it addresses it by doing the Cassandra thing. It points out how horrible life could be if we let it get beyond a certain point. Um, is anybody listening? Probably not. Possibly so. Um, but it thinks that it can look at things and provide bad examples and possibly counter solutions as well. So, over the next 40 odd years, from the 1960s onwards, science fiction returns again and again to these new and these familiar themes. Where is it now? It's still got this preoccupation with exploration, with alien life. It's looking outwards. It's finding new ways to explore the human condition by examining societies and cultures that aren't human. It's looking inward again. It's looking at our own societies. Um, anybody who is following sort of debates in science fiction online will notice that there are two big issues. One is political, left versus right, same old, same old. Uh, but one is a call for greater diversity, not just in, in science fiction writing, but among science fiction writers. People are starting to look at how other cultures perceive science fiction. Every culture does it. Every culture has always done it to some extent, whether it's fantasy and folklore, legend, or whether it's actually looking at the scientific process. Uh, African science fiction, you know, Africa is obviously a huge continent, but a lot of people within it are writing SF from the perspective of those countries. Chinese science fiction, um, which we don't really get to see or hear that much about, um, but it is there. South American science fiction, magical realism. Um, each culture throughout time takes the genre, takes fantasy, looks at what it wants to achieve, looks at where it's going wrong, and starts using the genre as a means of exploring. Where is it going? Western science fiction is looking very much currently at issues of race and issues of gender. What does gender mean? It's changing. People are changing. People are choosing to become other than what they are. It's looking at ideas about what gender is and how it might alter in the future. A lot of people are doing that at the moment. Um, how might we change? How might we change physically? You know, what are the limits of the human condition? How can we change ourselves? How can we alter ourselves? Um, this is going back to the island of Dr. Moreau again, gene splicing. Um, it's a theme of science fiction. How can we change ourselves as well as the world? There are calls for a greater diversity. Um, in the sense that science fiction stopped being the preserve of the dashing male hero quite a long time ago. There are still plenty of those. And it's looking at different ways of being, as many different horizons as possible. Utopias, dystopias. The internal and the external, our hopes and our fears. And as science itself changes in a way that sometimes seems to be speeding up, we're examining its impact on society. People are interested in science fiction because it's showing us the place where we're going to live. Now, sometimes it gets it wrong. Wells, for example. Um, sometimes it gets it right. And sometimes it impacts back on the scientific process in the sense that a lot of people who want to become scientists are science fiction fans. Does science fiction give people ideas? Did William Gibson's Neuromancer give people the idea for producing the internet? Um, I don't want to take too much credit um, for science fiction writers for impacting on the research that people are actually doing. But there is a connection between them. And there is a tension between them. 
to an extent, science fiction writers, unfortunately, are notoriously terrible at predicting the future. Um, they, we fail to foresee miniaturization. If you think of the average Star Trek episode, it's set several hundred years in the future, and the computer bank is the size of this room. Nowadays, well, laptop. We do have handheld communicators. Um, I have been trying to research the first time in which a video phone, like a Skype um, application, appears in science fiction. And so far, I've got it back to the 1920s with, of all things, Stella Gibbons' Cold Comfort Farm, uh, which is a parody of rural um, comedy writing and isn't actually a science fiction at all. And yet it is. People have personalized aircraft in that version of the 1920s. They can see each other when they make a phone call. So all of these ideas are kind of sneaking in and impacting on how people see things and what they do with them. So in terms of my own work, um, what inspired me, briefly, to write science fiction? It was all of these things. Um, when I was a, a young girl, my mother brought back um, copies of a writer called Jack Vance from the local library. And they were classic space fantasy adventure. They were about people going off to other planets, meeting amazing creatures, other life forms, very, very different societies. Uh, my particular strain of science fiction has always, to an extent, been sociological. It's been looking at societies, not so much the science behind them, um, but the social structures themselves. Societies in which I can never live. Mostly, in my case, societies in which I don't want to live. I tend towards the dystopian end of the spectrum. Um, but the inspiration behind that comes from other ways of being and how far we can take that particular frontier in social terms. What are the extremes? Science fiction allows us to look at extremes in a way that mainstream fiction doesn't. This is where the fears come in, as well as the hopes. Ian Banks, um, Scottish writer, now sadly deceased, is a brave writer because he takes utopias and he sees how far they could logically be extended. Sometimes they result in the complete destruction of a, a particular social form. Um, his populations of planets sometimes translate to somewhere else entirely. They upload. They get rid of their bodies. They are within a kind of a mainframe. That's not something that we have the option of doing at the moment. But how would it be if we could? That's what writers like Banks are trying to do. They're trying to look at the limits of what humans can actually achieve. And they're trying to look at the problems that arise from that and the solutions that we might achieve in resolving them. So, lots and lots of frontiers, lots and lots of different ways of being, ways of changing, ways of staying the same, and all of these are wrapped up in the genre that we call science fiction. This has been a, a gallop through the history of SF. Um, I've picked out a very few people but I'm sure that you will have more examples, um, especially if you're a science fiction fan. So what I'm going to do now is to throw this open um, to you and ask what your questions are and what your personal frontiers are in terms of what you like to read and where you think we're going. So, any questions? Can you think of a better name than science fiction? This type of writing. Uh, well, we've had science fiction in the 20s, um, science fantasy, which I think is quite a good one because a lot of the science described in so-called science fiction isn't really science, it's magic. Uh, it's not explained sufficiently to be science. Um, the genre has kind of settled down in, into science fiction in that if you call it speculative fiction, publishers don't seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> So to an extent, I think the, um, the decision has been commercial as much as anything else. Uh, what would you like to see it called? <laughs> <laughs>
uh, the, the nearest I've ever come is sort of like the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which seems to cover the, right. the whole actual area. Yeah. But uh, even that's not an ideal name. No. No, it's it, science fiction will stuck with it. Well, I think it shows you how big the genre actually is. I have seen it suggested that uh, so-called mainframe fiction is actually a branch of science fiction. Oh, right, it's okay. The oh, they won't like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. I noticed you didn't mention violence and death too much. No. I happen to watch an old science fiction film and something like the thing. Yes. Like it's coming in the world. Yes. Two, two, two or three remakes. The first thing that happens to this picture when it's frozen out the polar ice and approaches a human is it gets shot. Yes. And then eaten by dogs. Yes. I know the it dwells on that and that's a common feature throughout most of science fiction. Yes. Predator, alien, all these things are killing, death and human Supremacy in those fields. Yes. And really, uh, that's a more common thing than anything else. That may be a Hollywood effect. It part, yeah. Pictures, but it's actually more violent than you, you, you are drawing attention to. Well, to an extent, it's the fear of the other. That um, what human beings are supposed to do when the other shows up is to exterminate it. Um, because the tension between it and you is too great. This is where we've got this, this 1950s um, communist fear coming in. And that's, I, I can't remember when the thing was made, but it sort of, it does reflect that. The fear of something that can change its shape, that can look like you and mimic you. Um, but in terms of um, later movies like Alien and Predator, you don't have that. They're very much a thing in themselves. The monster is, remains the monster. It doesn't mimic other life forms. Um, but yes, we do try to kill it because it's trying to kill us. Um, now, to a certain extent, I think that is the Hollywood effect, in that if you have um, a first contact movie in which aliens turn up on the White House lawn, and they're really nice, and we like them, you have a very short film. Um, so to an extent, you have, you have a kind of narrative impetus, uh, which is about tension conflict, overcoming things, being overcome. And that to an extent is, is something that writers tend to fall back on because it's quite an easy narrative structure to deal with and it's also popular. Um, Larry Correa's Monster Hunter International is a massive seller and it, it is so because it's humans against the other. Maybe. Yeah. Well, that's certainly not good, and you do have a number of science fiction novels in which that happens. Um, we go to other planets, uh, we manage to completely screw up the world for the natives. Um, somebody was mentioning this week uh, a novel by Octavia Butler, which she actually disowned, um, because it was, again, about people going to another planet, the native population are a bit primitive, it doesn't end well. Um, and she felt that that was too much of a cliche in terms of colonialism and post-colonialism. Um, so she kind of abandoned that as a structure and went on to look at a different dynamic, basically. And I think people are trying to look for different dynamics. Um, is it human nature? You know, that's something that science fiction can address. Yeah. Yes. It's it's part of the function of the genre is to point to human situations, um, take them to that extreme view, to allow us to look at them in a different light. So you're drawing analogies between how we treat animals. How aliens treat us is a very good illustration, you know, in some science fiction, of how that, that dynamic works. Um, so it's, it's a great metaphor. You know, it can allow us to do an awful lot of things. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, apart from the violence, you, yeah. uh, I find much more frightening or scarier um, 
the science fiction novels that actually are not provided, like uh, 1984 or yeah. um, A Brave New World or yeah. Fahrenheit 451, which are dystopias in itself, would you also include them in science fiction? Very definitely. There is no science in it? Or? Yes, very definitely, yes. Because they're looking at alternative structures of being, alternative societies. Um, alternate history is, is another one, actually. Um, but I, because we've had such limited time, I've had to leave a lot out. Um, but periods at which history could have gone in one of several directions, and science fiction writers choose to explore one of those directions, um, those can be very interesting. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson's The Years of Rice and Salt is a very good example of that, in which most of Europe is wiped out by the Black Death. So Europe doesn't get off the ground as a scientific powerhouse. <laughs> Um, that's left to Central Asia, to China, to the Middle East. You know, where would they have gone? There's a certain inevitability of scientific process in Robinson's work, but um, you know, you, you can see that, you can kind of take that on board or leave it as you choose. Um, but I do think those are uh, the novels that you mention are classic SF, yes. And where do you find, for, uh, I, for example, I find those more scary than yeah. an alien actually killing. Yeah. Uh, Yes. So I, I, yes. It's hard to explain, probably but, because it's coming from us than from outside. Of well, they are more insidious, they are less obvious, and they have to do with ourselves being taken over by ourselves. So it's, and it's, you know, by no means um, too far fetched. You know, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale is very definitely science fiction. Um, and that's a terrifying society in which you know, women's reproductive rights have been very, very drastically curtailed. It's going back to a kind of biblical um, gender apportioning. And there are significant portions of the United States that would like to do that you know, and are trying to do that. So that's why it's scary. It's scary because it could happen. You know, and 1984 is written as a response to seeing that possibility. Um, so the likelihood of aliens turning up and hunting us down, well, it could be, but uh, you know, the likelihood of a slow, insidious dictatorship taking over this country, yeah, of course it could happen. That's why it's scary. But that is a very good point, and thank you. Did you want to? Yeah, this probably goes into a similar direction. You mentioned that Mary Shelley's fun, fun yes. is uh, quite the scene of one of the first modern science fiction stories. Yes. Um, what do you think about Thomas More's Utopia. Yeah. It was actually written. I had to look it up actually. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Yeah. 1916 actually was yes. written in Latin. Yes. So yeah. he's picturing a fictional society on island yes. that pretty much lives in a socialist society. So, yes. Um, what do you think about this? I mean, it, it is yeah. the, from a sociological and political point of view, it is. Yes, fiction. it is science fiction. Yes, it's often cited as, as an example of, uh, of that particular strand. It's, it's looking at utopias, obviously. That's where it starts. Um, and it's yeah, and it's one of the first um, ideas of a society being radically different, um, because when you're sort of looking at medieval cultures, you're looking at an idea in a sense that there isn't a future, that things are just going to go on as they have always been. It's partly that there are religious dictates behind yeah. that, um, that it's God ordained, so it won't ever change. Um, people like Moore are actually very brave in envisaging a radical departure from that. What would happen if we did? A lot of science fiction is asking what would happen if. You know, if you had to define the genre in a single sentence, that would probably be it. And then add you know, any number of multiple possibilities at the end of that sentence. But um, yeah, it's a very good example because he is looking at something that isn't. Could it be? Possibly not at the time of writing. But what are we doing if we're not trying to, in a way, perfect our society at the moment? You know, people have strong ideals about the sort of society we should be living in. And uh, other people have equally strong ideals in perhaps the opposite direction. So, yeah. And especially with picturing a socialist society who was yeah. actually centuries ahead of yes. and us, yes. you know, picking up yes. on that again. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, you know where does that where does that come from? Again, it's what if we actually did create this, you know, which societies have. So, but for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? 
Um, you, yes. You touched upon the relationship between uh, science fiction writers in the world of science fiction and science. Yes. And I was wondering if you could expand upon this and maybe reflect on whether there is any cause for bringing the two closer together or whether it actually functions better to have them veer off separately. Right. What is the uh, view from the other side, let's say, uh, on this perspective, if we should treat this differently than it is right now or if it's perfectly fine the way it is? Uh, well, I, I, I confess to some embarrassment in that scientists are far more useful to us than we are to scientists, I think, <laughs> at the moment, um, in that I wouldn't say that science fiction is parasitic, but certainly we are drawing as writers a lot of ideas from scientific paradigms and how science is changing the world at the moment. I'm not sure that we're actually giving enough back, um, although I ought to note that there are science fiction writers who are scientists themselves. Al Reynolds, for example, is a, a cosmologist, I think. Um, so quite a few science fiction writers have been scientists or are scientists. And whether they're actually using their own disciplines, because some of them don't, in their work, and whether their work is reflecting back upon their colleagues' work in the field, um, I think somebody possibly ought to be looking at that a little bit close, more closely than we are. Um, but certainly, you know, could what I write affect anybody's scientific research? Not so much. Um, because my science is, is, I have to say, in my novels, very spurious. So I'm here under slight false pretenses. <laughs> well, I think that's maybe underestimating the effect of science fiction that mm. has had in shaping the way that science yes. has moved forward. I mean, I'm just looking, thinking of examples like the, picking one off the top of my head, the space elevator. Yes. Which is still one of those popular ideas that yeah. uh, we still we talk about in the scientific community. Yes. Um, so I, mm. I don't know if it is necessarily so true that it is all one way traffic. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> it's, um, I'm, I think it affects, um, writing affects scientific research perhaps more in the attitude that the young scientist brings to the discipline. Um, so there is that sense of wonder among young science fiction fans um, and that enthusiasm and that wish to see something really different, radical, something change, something world changing. Um, that sort of idealistic vision, and I'm not knocking it by the way, I think it's a great thing, um, that when taken into a field of research, even then, if it's then constrained by more realistic limitations, as to what the discipline is actually capable of achieving. Possibly that still drives people. Um, and I do know a lot of scientists who say that they were inspired by early science fiction, um, as in the science fiction they read when they were young. Um, not so much in terms of the ideas, but certainly in terms of the enthusiasm that they brought to the scientific process. Um, people want to become scientists because they read science fiction sometimes. Not always. Yeah, the, the aspect of it that I find intriguing is the fact that I think that as scientists, are also bound by the laws that dictate science. Yes. Whereas a science fiction author, I think you can be a little bit more boundless in your imagination of what is possible. Yes. And that can inform the pessimistic view that a scientist maybe has that yes. uh, you have to remain within the rational yes. laws that you know to be true at the moment. Well, I think the other thing is that scientific paradigms are always changing. They have always changed. Um, so any um, scientists don't have the idea that it's all sort of um, generally fixed and absolutely static and absolutely right. It's got to be subject to experimental dictates, certainly. But it does keep expanding and expanding and changing and changing. You know, we don't have the science that we had 300 years ago. Uh, we don't have the science now that we will have, I believe, 300 years hence. Um, so. Yeah, it's, um, the imagination is a great thing, um, but we do cheat, you know, because we're not constrained. And I think there is quite a lot of tension between readers who are scientists, you know, saying that's, that really isn't possible. Faster than light, for example, is the one that always gets cited. Uh, we would love it to be the case, maybe it will, but not under the current paradigm. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. A little bit on the link between science and uh, actually sci sci fi authors, and you take the space elevator as an example. If you, if you look back one century, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky actually he was 
as far as I know, the yes. first one, who wrote an article about the space elevator. And oh, OK. To the cosmos by electric train. Wow. So, and unless he was a scientist, actually developed famous rocket equations and yeah. other really famous contributions to science. Yes. He wrote this article, more or less like it was an article in a, in a newspaper in, in Prague. So, and it reads like a science fiction sort of short story. It's the first time mm. he actually mentioned this concept. So, and there you see that there actually there was a very strong link okay. to him being a scientist, but also being, if you want, contemporary science fiction. <coughs> yeah, and inspired. Inspiration. Where does that come from? Yeah. Was there somebody? Sorry, I'm neglecting this half of the room slightly. Well, actually, I have a question. Yeah. Some more to what they were asking. I mean, if, if I look at Star Trek, that was created in the 60s, yeah. the future was bright, and, and the technology was solving everything. All problems were solved. But if I look at recent science fiction movies, it's quite the opposite. Yes. It's always gloomy, and uh, yes. the, the technology is turning against us. Yes. Is that we have lost hope, or we take it for granted? Um, I think it is um, a cycle. I think it will cycle back into optimism. Um, Star Trek itself, in its various incarnations, has gone through um, quite a big set of um, changes. So 1960s Star Trek, the original, is, is very much sort of very upbeat. Science solves everything. Um, diplomacy solves everything, actually, which is clearly not the case. And then once, once you get into the... Um, I guess the 1980s with the next generation. It's still optimistic, but it's a little bit tempered by real politic. And there are episodes in which science does not solve the problem. And talking to people does not solve the problem. Um, Deep Space Nine was written explicitly as a metaphor for the Yugoslav conflict. And, you know, it's, it's very grim in a lot of places. A lot of things don't work out in that show. Uh, it doesn't necessarily end terribly well. And that, you know, surprisingly for its, its time, it's, um, it's also questioning the Federation, uh, which in a sense is questioning America. Um, I, why America and the Federation are actually kind of seen as synonymous, I have no idea, because the Federation is actually socialist. Um, but hey, you know, it, but it's seen as the good guys. They're seen as the good guys. And Deep Space Nine actually questions that. Star Trek Voyager, we're back to Muldoon and the Odyssey again. You know, going out, um, okay, they, there's narrative tension because they're actually lost and they can't get home um, until the end. But that's very much more consciously back to original Star Trek. Um, and I think it was seen, that's, that's not necessarily a um, creative decision. It's a decision that came about because viewers were saying, oh, it's got too gloomy and we want to go back to um, Captain Kirk and, you know, bounding around seducing women and that kind of thing. So, yeah, you know, it's a, it to an extent it is a response to viewer need, I think. Um, but it, it cycles backwards and forwards. And fantasy is going through the same thing. A lot of fantasy has been very sort of, um, well, cheery and pleasant and beautiful. And now we've got Game of Thrones, which is really grim. And we'll probably go back to having something pleasant and beautiful again, I suspect. And then the, the opposite. It, it always cycles around. Another question. Um, what is your take on uh, some universities are now offering a degree future studies, which are uh, well, in later in Hawaii or Kurzweil with the singularities near. Right. So they are actually taking it from a scientific point of view, trying to, well, they themselves say not predict the future, but create future. So if they say, no, we're not predicting futures, we are creating. We're creating them. Yeah. And pushing the technologies that will result in a singularity in the next 20, 30 years. Do they take a lot of ideas from science fiction? <coughs> are they more? Are other closer to scientists or to science fiction writers, these futurists? Mm. Um, I think that we need a history of futurism or a history of future predictions um, to get an idea of what, how they've actually, whether they've actually got things right. Um, because this creation thing is all very well, but it's going to be constrained by uh, funding, politics, all the things that science is constrained by. Um, it's going to be constrained by natural law. So there's got to be a limit as to 
how far you can generate predictions that are also causal. Um, that's a really interesting point. And I think we do need to look back at the history. I know a couple of people who are sort of futurologists, they're employed by airlines to try and predict the future of aviation and stuff like that. Now, are they getting it right? I don't know. <laughs> I think you would have to look very carefully at that. It's a great idea. Um, it's, it's got great potential for drama and comedy and complete disaster from a narrative point of view. Um, in terms of its efficacy, I think time is going to tell, ironically. Um, how far do their powers of creation extend? Yeah, OK. I, have to, I will have to think about that. OK, then I think we, we can close here the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Thank you. As for all the invited speakers to uh, this week of, of lectures, so we have a small gift oh, for that you. Is, that is very kind. Thank <laughs> you very much. Our glass with a with your Oh, thank you very much. That's exceedingly kind of you. It's nice to be able thank to you. come and talk. Thank you. Thank you.